Got another little lecturette here for you. We're going to do one on the neck. Here are the objectives for the neck. If you want to go through them, just pause it right now and you can then work your way through them. But we're not going to spend the time here and we're going to move right on. So here we go. When we started dissecting out, skinning the neck of the horse, we found this very thin muscle down here. It's often V-shaped, the cutaneous coli muscle. Um, generally down in this portion of the muscle it's thicker. Um, it covers over the jugular groove making it difficult to do jugular stick in this part of the neck. Um, but remember unlike in this horse some of these horses you saw that it extended up that ventral midline of the neck all the way up to the throat latch. And that's important to remember when you're placing a tracheostomy tube because you have another layer of muscle just below the skin that you will cut through before you get to the sternothyrohyoideus muscle. We'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Okay, here on the lateral side of the neck we can see the jugular groove really nicely. Here's our external jugular vein. We see that the jugular groove has boundaries. We have a dorsal boundary made up by the brachiocephalicus muscle and a ventral boundary by the sternocephalicus muscle. We see this is true also in the dog. We see in the horse that there is an omohyoideus muscle passing between the external jugular vein and the carotid sheath in this cranial portion of the neck. This makes it a little safer to do an external jugular stick without accidentally going into the common carotid artery. So the omohyoideus muscle is not present in the canine. Now let's have a look at the bovine. So in the bovine we see external jugular vein here. Dorsal boundary once again is the brachiocephalicus muscle. The ventral boundary is going to be the sternomandibulous portion part of the sternocephalicus muscle. We're going to find that the, the medial aspect of the jugular groove is occupied by the sternomastoideus portion of the sternocephalicus. Okay, that sternomastoideus portion may be reduced or absent in sheep. This results in a more indistinct ventral border of the jugular groove. Some like to say that is why it's a little difficult to perform a jugular venipuncture in sheep. Personally I found it rather easy to do venipuncture in sheep in the jugular vein but that was just me. Okay, The omohyoideus which we saw in the horse is not truly omo in bovine even though we still call it the omohyoideus and that is because it comes off the third and fourth cervical vertebra but still we call it the omohyoideus. Okay so here now we see the sternocephalicus muscle. You can see its bifurcation there here we've reflected it to better expose the sternothyrohyoideus muscle. So the sternothyroideus and the sternohyoideus are going to have a common portion of the belly which we're going to call the sternothyrohyoideus. More cranially it will divide into the sternothyroideus and the sternohyoideus. As I said when we're placing a um, tracheostomy tube we're going to place it in the junction of the middle third with the cranial third of the neck. And as we said, in some cases we may have to transect through that cutaneous coli muscle before we actually see the sternothyrohyoideus. And then we separate that muscle, separate the two sides of that muscle to expose the trachea. 
So here in the dog, we can see the sternocephalicus muscle reflected, the sternohyoideus muscle down the midline, and then a little more lateral to that is the sternothyroideus muscle. Whereas in the large animal, we see those two muscles fused distally, and as we get more cranially towards the head, they become separated into the two muscles that we see here. Okay, so here we've got a horse head. If we lift the horse's head and kind of tilt it away from us, we can see the tendon of insertion of the sternocephalicus muscle. Here we also see the lingual facial vein. And if we combine that with the vent caudal edge of the mandible, we have now created a triangle known as Viborg's triangle. Viborg's triangle is an access point for the guttural pouch and the medial and lateral retropharyngeal lymph nodes for surgical access. So this is a very important structure. Okay, if we remember in the equine that we have the cervical vertebra embedded in the neck so that we have a lot of muscle as well as the nuchal ligament dorsal to that when we're giving an intramuscular injection in the neck which is not always the best area because drainage isn't quite as good if we were to induce an infection into the area but where we're going to want to do this so we're going to make sure that we are going above those vertebrae as well as not so high to inject into the nuchal ligament. So we have to make a triangle right about here. Those are the best places for an intramuscular injection. Okay, so now here I've exposed the superficial cervical lymph nodes, also referred to as the prescapular lymph nodes by many clinicians because they do sit in front of the scapula. Notice they are just as in the dog, they are deep to the homotransversarius muscle. In the bovine, it's generally one large lymph node. In the canine, we often saw two lymph nodes. In the equine, there's multiple very small lymph nodes. This is going to be true of most of the lymph nodes in the bovine and the equine. The bovine has singular large ones and the equine has multiple small ones. Okay, so now here we expose the middle deep cervical lymph nodes in the middle part of the neck along the trachea. These are not always seen, especially on our smaller horses and ponies. So we're not going to worry too much about those. Just know that they are sometimes there. Especially in our young, they're going to be hard to find because as we see here in this calf, the thymus is going to extend up the neck along the trachea. So in both the equine and in the bovine, in the young, not only is the thymus cranial to the heart, but it also extends up the neck along the trachea. Okay, the cranial deep cervical lymph nodes we're going to see adjacent to the thyroid glands when we get to the head. Okay, we see here we've reflected the brachiocephalicus muscle. There's our superficial cervical lymph node again in the bovine but we see a down around the thoracic inlet, the caudal deep cervical lymph nodes. In the equine, we're going to see those also in that same region. I want to also point out here on this section the subclavius muscle. This is a, a new one that we have not seen. It is not present in the canine. Subclavius muscle is a rather stout muscle sitting cranial to the supraspinatus muscle. It's going to then attach to the sternum. And here we see in the bovine, it's a much smaller muscle. It's going to attach to the medial surface of the brachiocephalic muscle and then attach to the sternum. So here now we've exposed the carotid sheath. See here the external jugular vein, 
left it out of our way. You see the common carotid artery. Always dorsal and slightly medial is going to be the vagosympathetic trunk, just as we saw in the dog. And then ventral to that, along the trachea, we're going to see the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. We go over to the left side. We find the esophagus on the left side. Don't confuse this as some other muscle. It is the esophagus sitting dorsal to the trachea and in the neck more to the left. There's the trachea. Generally we're going to find the left recurrent laryngeal nerve running along the trachea between it and the esophagus. Okay, here now we have exposed the sternothyrohyoidus muscle making this particular division of it the sternohyoidus muscle and this one sternothyroidus muscle. Okay, here once again we have exposed the omohyoidus muscle in the bovine. Okay, the, now what is the action of these muscles? It's going to retract the base of the tongue in the larynx during swallowing. Okay, a big problem we see in horses is cribbing. Um, this is very an annoying habit. They won't eat. Um, basically they're kind of swallowing air. It's bad in that it can result in colic. Also it teaches the neighbor horses to do the same thing. We try to stop them from doing it by treating the wood. We may put a cribbing muzzle on the animal. There's also cribbing collars. There are also cribbing rings. Fit up in between the teeth. Numerous things to try to stop this habit. There is a surgery that is done called the modified four cells procedure. Basically what is done here is a laser cut segment of the sternohyoideus, sternothyroideus, and the omohyoideus muscles as well as the ventral branches of the first two spinal nerves to stop them from having the ability to do this. You got to consider what functions then are going to be lost if we do this. Okay, let's move on to the nuchal ligament. Nuchal ligament is a lot of fun here. Okay, in the large animal here we have the funicular part. Remember, funicular refers to cord, so it's very cord-like. Then we have the laminar part, which is sheet-like. In the horse, we see that between the funicular portion and the atlas is the cranial nuchal bursa. This may become irritated with poor fitting halters or um, bridles and it results in a problem known as pole evil. It becomes inflamed. There is a caudal nuchal bursa above the axis. Now in our dissections we're not going to see these per se. More we would see they, they're usually flattened, so they're hard to appreciate, but when we can find them, they basically have a shiny inner surface. Okay, and we have a third one, the supraspinous bursa. Um, generally, above this dorsal spinous process of T2, maybe T3 and 4. Now, this one also can become infected because of a poor fitting saddle. And this results in what's known as fistulous withers. We'll see that those burst out. The best treatment when you treat that is to make sure that it heals from the inside out, rather the outside first, so that we don't capture any microorganisms in there. Generally, I've seen them as traumatic. It could, can be infectious from brucella abortus. Okay, so here's a question for you. Nuchal ligament is absent in the dog, absent in the cat, absent in both, or present in both. 
Yes, it is present in the dog, but not in the cat. And remember, it doesn't go up to the skull as it does in the large animal. It only goes up to the axis. So here now we're looking at the dissection of these ligaments. See the funicular portion? That's the only portion present in the canine. The laminar part is quite extensive in both the horse and the bovine. So what is the importance of these? Well, it's, remember, it's made up of elastic connective tissue, so it's an elastic ligament. It's, it stretches, so when they put their head down to graze, they're just basically using muscles to flex their neck. And then if they're startled, that allows rapid extension of the neck without work by the extensor muscle, just relaxation of the flexor muscles. So they're conserving energy and it allows a much more rapid lifting of the head when they're startled while grazing. It also conserves energy in the horse when you watch the horse run and its head goes forward and back and forward and back. It contributes to this passive head movement during locomotion so that it's conserving energy there as well. That is all I have for you. Thank you very much.